Hello all, this is Chip Kemp. Hope everyone is doing well. We appreciate you all joining in on us for this, I guess, second webinar officially since we all visited not too many weeks ago. A um, Couple things just to remind us of before we get fired up this evening. Along the way, we sure hope you have some questions. Should you have a question, you'll see there's a box that says questions. Uh, Click on that and, and type your question in there. We'll be monitoring that as we go along. And so don't hesitate at all. And if you just really, really want to talk, um, that's cool too. Just raise your hand and um, we'll uh, let you chime in as we get a little farther into the call or into the webinar. So tonight's webinar is going to be a little bit of groundwork for where we're starting in the project now that you all know picked up your cattle, we got them here. Greatly appreciate all the help that, that you all provided. So many of you, uh, you, your, your folks, um, grandparents, went friends, went way out of the way to uh, uh, make travel of those cattle as easy on them. And to be honest, as easy on me as possible. And I greatly thank you for that. Uh, you should know that um, all, the, all the miles it took to collect those calves, no issues, everything went swimmingly. The cattle handled the travels great. So none of those things were any sort of concerns whatsoever. I think we put on nearly 3,700 miles getting those cattle and everything worked the way you draw it up on the book. So that's, that's awesome. And so I say thank you to each of you. Um, on the call tonight, uh, we have a, have a handful of colleagues along with me. Dr. Jackie Atkins is with us. Um, Bailey Abel is with us. And if computer stuff really goes haywire, you're going to hear me scream Kathy. That would be Kathy Schaefer. And she's here to make sure that we don't mess anything up just too awful bad. So we're going to get started. And like I said, any questions at all, don't hesitate to uh, put that there in the box. So let's pull this thing up here so we can see what we need to see. So you all know your calves came in over the first week of November. Um, what you may or may not know is those cattle came in over the over the span of about five or six days. Um, different travel arrangements, different folks calling. It, it took a, a number of days to get them all in there. So we wanted to give the calves an equitable amount of time uh, to get adjusted to their environment so that there was an even-handed approach to the competition. So we went ahead and left them on their uh, initial uh, heavy forage receiving diet for a little extra period of time than we normally would. They started actually uh, to step those cattle up a couple days prior to the 18th just because they felt like they were plenty ready, but we didn't want to rush them because some of those cattle hadn't been in, in the yard quite as long. Remember those cattle are at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Um, and so on the 18th, we went ahead and processed those calves. So that will technically then become the beginning of the project. Um, oh, I've got a question already. I like it. Give me one moment. Ellis, I, I have that you might have a question. That's true. I'm going to raise you. I'm going to unmute you. And if you have a question, you can ask that question. Otherwise, maybe it's a mistake. Nope. You might have to unmute yourself if you would wish, wish to talk. OK, Ellis, I'm not hearing you. Oh, the hand went away. If you do have a question, don't feel free, feel free to all to type them in down below. And then if we want to chat and talk a little bit more in a little bit. So those cattle came in, started the project that we saw that we call the steer profitability competition on the 18th. They were processed, they received the various products that we're going to talk about here in a few moments. And that is the beginning of the competition portion of this feed out theory. So the first product that your calves received on that date, by the way, cool picture here on the right of one of Miss um, Ellis's calves, um, and, and loading from one trailer to another um, in Nashville, Tennessee, more or less. 
Those calves received Bova Shield Gold 5. That's a product we use pretty routinely. That's commonly used in the feed yard setting if we use it extensively uh, in this project. The University of Missouri really believes in that product. It is a respiratory type product that helps against a number of the uh, various maladies and illnesses that are a function of what we might call the BRD complex of uh, various diseases and illnesses. And so Mobus of Gold is a prominent product and one that uh, the feed yard manager there at the University of Missouri believes in very heavily. Secondly, we well, speaking of, there is the feed yard manager. I wanted to show you that Kenneth Lademan, Mr. Lademan runs that feed yard and he loves this particular project so much so that he was playing hurt that day. Um, you might see there on his uh, right side, he's wearing a boot and was rolling around. You might not be able to see the cart he's rolling around on, but he's actually catching cattle, squeezing cattle, uh, giving the warmer and implants all on his wheeled cart. So he's pretty passionate about this project that you all as juniors have. Um, Vision 7 is another product that the university strongly believes in, again, one that's commonly used. This product is used to prevent, again, a number of different uh, issues. One, which is black leg, which is one in the center part of the country we have to be aware of. Some parts of the country don't have to worry about that concern quite as much. It also provides some pink eye protection, but its primary function that most of us would think about are some bacterial uh, issues, some clostridial issues and others that uh, might cause in, in particular some, some gut health issues and things of that nature. Again, much of this associated with uh, that BRB complex that we will certainly talk about in a later webinar in more detail. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on these products, but I want you to know that your calves have received them. And so uh, th this will be something that we'll delve into a little bit later down the road. Of course, as you all know back home, we gotta keep our parasites under control. And so cattle at this feed yard are dewormed with safeguard. Uh, again, another very common orally proved and orally administered product that is widely used. Implants. There are a lot of different implants, and these implants are given again. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these because, again, that will be for a subsequent call. But implants are really used to boost gain, and there are a variety of different implants available. Um, they have different mechanisms, uh, how they mechanics behind how they work. They can be delivered in different series and all those things. Um, at the University of Missouri, they've grown to really appreciate uh, the component TE, TES um, implant. That is an implant that has pilot in it. Um, Mr. Lademan, not only does he manage the University of Missouri's feed yard where they run a number of cattle, but prior to that time, he ran a commercial yard that was fairly sizable and he ran that for a few years. And he compared a number of implants in that setting and he's told me in his time since he swapped to uh, this particular implant that has Tylen or Tylosin, as you can see there on the box, um, he has never had a single infection that he's aware of associated with implants. So he believes in that Tylen uh, as, as a health aid to keep those cattle healthy and avoid any sort of infections. I put a visual up, and, and many of you probably already know this, but if you don't know, there are a couple places you can attempt to give implants where it's most common is up here on the very top of the ear where hopefully you can see my cursor moving uh, that top box where it says locations for injections that's where uh, we typically try to administer implants and did so quite successfully on the 18th also we need to study the genomics of your calves so for us to do that, we have to collect a DNA sample. Now, many of you all at home have done this and you might have collected hair, you might have used a blood card. Both of those are very useful and both of those will work quite effectively. However, the latest technology and, and, and the best technology, frankly, is a tissue sampling unit. Uh, it's, a, it's a small vial from a company called Allflex and um, Actually, you can see a few on the table, but I'll come back to that in a second. But at that same time, when we collect those, um, we'll also tag with both the visual tag and the ID tag. So in the packet of, that comes looking like this, you can see the little piece with the red connector, that's our TSU vial. 
And what we do is we take that um, little vial and we insert it and you can see the blue tagger laying on the table. It looks like an ear tagger, uh, looks very much the same. And you put this vial and you can actually even see one actually in there if you look really close. And you put that in there and you just punch a hole in the ear much like you would an ear tag. And then that puts in a small piece of tissue it's in a solution where it's very safe and it's very stable. You don't have to worry so much about temperature or refrigeration or contamination. It's a very uh, sound mechanism to keep your tissue sample safe and clean and free from contaminants. And that's really important so we get an accurate genomic sample when we send that off to the lab. That TSU then is coded to match the ear tag, the visual ear tag, and you can see above the ear tag number in this case, so you see the smallest is 24. Above that, it has a code, a 15 digit code, and that's the EID, the electronic identification. And that corresponds to the little white button that you see in that same little packet, that EID button. And so all of these, both of those tags will go in the ear and the EID is what the, the feed system will read. So we'll show that here in just a second. So all the calves are ran through and they receive the various uh, shots and dewormer and implants that we talked about. And then they each receive, uh, well, each give a tissue sample. Then they receive their visual ear tag, the yellow tags, and then they receive an EID. And again, big thank you to our friends at Allflex who make these products um, available at, at, at essentially a cost effort for you all to be involved in this kind of project. These are great packets, by the way, if somebody's interested in doing this sort of stuff at the house, um, anybody can do it. It's not terribly complicated if you want to have that sort of system at home. Now, how does that system really work? Well, what happens here is these cattle are on, and many of you know this already, if you're new to us, this terminology might be new to you, they're on what we call a grow safe feed unit. Um, and these grow safe units monitor weights every time the animal approaches the bunk or the water trough. So you can see the small circles in each of them, both the red calf and the black calf, they circle the location of where the EID button is in the ear. And on the left picture, I left the red calves in there so that it'd be very clear when we're talking. When you look in the picture with the red calves, you can see up front, that's one of the grow safe feed bunks. And so when a calf walks up in there, there is a, an, a reader for those ear tags, those ear EID buttons. When they put their head in there, it starts measuring. And underneath that feed bunk are a number of load cells or scales. And so as that animal eats, it's measuring exactly how much food that animal consumes while it's up in that stanchion eating out of that tub. And so every time that animal goes up to the tub, if it goes up to the tub two times a day or 20 times a day, or if it sticks its head in for a second and gets startled and backs out and sticks its head right back in, those are individual feeding events. And the Grow Safe system is going to monitor each of those. And starting next month, actually starting here in a few weeks, you'll start getting reports that show how those animals are doing. Those reports will be a little delayed from the first of the month. And so it'll be a little bit before you start seeing those, but you'll see those pretty soon. Now, one of the things that's new for the first time in the SPC this year, if we look on the right, and these are, are, are a group of your calves on the right, and you can see this isn't actually a feed bunk. What this is, is a cage around the water tank where these calves drink. And what happens is at the ground, every time they walk in to get a drink, they walk in on a set of load cells or scales. And so that EID tag gets up, that computer up on the top, that reader, reads the weight of the cat every time they walk up. So we get daily measurements of front end weight, and so we can make some pretty strong estimates of then what the whole animal weighs. There's a lot of mathematical formulas that go into that. And so we're going to do something different this year that we've never gotten. Every other year, the SPC, we got a monthly weight. We're actually going to have a daily weight. And so we're going to be able to monitor things uh, much more thoroughly than we've done in the past. So I'm anxious as we get into next month to be able to dig into some of that data with you. Now, this is a picture of some of those TSU vials. Again, nothing fancy other than that you can see that uh, if you look really close in each one of those vials, there's a little green ball and a little red mark. And if you look between the green and the red, there's a thin piece of what appears to be white and that's a piece of the ear tissue. 
And that's what we use to send back to the lab. Our friends in this case at Neogen then will get these samples. They'll run for the, uh, the 100,000 genomic markers that we're gonna be looking for that will get reported to the eval on your CAS. And again, we won't go too deep into that because uh, Dr. Jackie is going to be talking about that process and some of that stuff next month. So I'll kind of save some of that information for her. Now, that's how we start the process. That's how we start the competition. But these cattle go back into their pens on the 18th and we crank it. Now, we have to assign a value to those calves at day one. Why? Well, because you could have, in theory, sold those calves and captured the value of those calves on the day or directly prior to sending them to the feed yard. So you could have sold them. Some of the older folks listening might know that if you've had an, an economics class, you might speak about this as, as an opportunity cost. You didn't take it, but you did have the opportunity where you could have sold them and got this money. Instead, you put them in the feed yard. And so for the sake of the feeding trial, it's essentially an expense. How much does the calf worth going in functions as an expense? And so as we talked, I think in our first webinar, we get the valuations for this project from the Nebraska Weekly Feeder Calf Report. Comes out weekly. You can see we processed on the 18th. If you look on this page on the left, this is for the week ending the 20th, Friday the 20th. So that's the week that corresponds to your calves. So after this came out, and this is not the full page, uh, the full sheet, you can see this is page one of five. So most of your calves fall on uh, some on this page, some on a sub subsequent page. And so this is where the prices were derived for your particular calves, how we get assigned that. And so what does that mean? That means then, there are 29 total steers in this year's steer profitability competition. Now, before we talk on any further, I want to explain something to you. One of the things that's really important to do a competition like this, or in the real world, feeding cattle profitably, is you've got to think in terms of the cost of moving these cattle around in big trucks. That's expensive, and so you typically want to get the truck as full as you possibly can. And since those big semi pop trucks rolled around 48,000 pounds, we want to get as close to that as we can when it comes time to ship. Well, at shipping time, that's usually around 34 to 35 calves. We'd like to be able to send a couple different loads. And that's something we'll talk about as we get farther in the project, why we would want to do that. And so ideally, we'd be sitting in a situation where we have the better part of 70 calves in this effort, meaning then when we split them in half, we could ship and we could maximize our efficient use of our dollars when we rent the use of that big semi to haul these calves uh, to, to the, uh, the harvest plant. Well, 29 certainly isn't 70. And so we do have a couple of breeders who have been very kind to put some cattle on feed in separate pins, but right alongside of yours. And when we add their pin, their calves, the total then counting your steers is 65. That gets us much closer to two, two pots worth. And that's going to allow us the privilege and the good fortune to sort your calves later at the end. And that's gonna be something that's very advantageous to us. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road. But I wanted to let you know, there's only 29 steers in the competition but there's going to be 65 total when it comes time to, to send these things to town. Now, when you go back to the Nebraska Weekly Summary Report that I showed you on the page before, if you had the entire report, this is what you would see. You'd have to dig through it and, and look through the numbers pretty good. But for that week, you can see where the values were on particular weight ranges. For example, if you had calves that weighed 550 to 599, so 550 to essentially 600 pounds, those calves were worth $1.59 or roughly $1.60 a pound. Or per hundred weight, that's what the CWT is, that means 100 pounds worth, it means you just take the 1.5995 times 100, and that gives you then that calf is worth 159.95 a hundred. One of the trends you'll see, and it holds true on here as well, traditionally, lighter weight calves are worth more per pound than heavier weight calves. There's a variety of reasons for that, but the primary reason is 
you can spend a little more per pound earlier because you have more time to experience um, return on investment or profit. And so it gives you the ability to maybe uh, spend a little more when you have more time on the backside. Um, and so as you see, as you go down this page, for the most part, the numbers go down. It starts at 167 at the five weight calves. As you approach the 50 calves, it gets down to about $1.47. So about a 20 cent swing. And that trend stays pretty stable, except for I will point out a couple of things that were kind of unique on this particular week. If you look at the 700 pound calves, the two different groups, the 750 pound calves are actually worth more than the 700s. And in the same way, the 850 calves that week were bringing more than the 800s. Minor differences, so it may not mean a great deal, but I just point that out because it's a, a little bit of a uniqueness in the data set. So, some things to talk about your calves. Average weight across those 29 calves, this, all this stuff is amongst the 29, by the way. Just shy of 672 pounds. Those calves ranged from just a little over five, so 512, to 868 pounds. So a pretty wide range, no question. So then when you take those weights and then you, you again, go back to our previous screen, you plot those weights in their appropriate spot and you multiply it by their, their value per pound or per hundred weight, however you want to do it, then our average initial dollar uh, per pound was a dollar 52 something. So essentially about a dollar 53 or 152 74 per hundred. Again, the range there is a little over 145 up to about 167. Then you take those per pound prices or per hundred weight prices and you multiply them by those weights, by the weights that associated with that calf, then that gives you our initial expense of the calf, our initial valuation of the calf. The average calf valuation of those 29 was $1,021.54. Well, we got a pretty, well, pretty wide range. Um, we have a calf range from 857 to a little over 1282. So you can show that, again, most of that's a function, just calves weigh different weights. And so they're gonna have a different expense coming in. Interestingly enough, some of you might say, uh oh, um, I already have a lot more expenses than somebody else. I can tell you as we look at the previous years, and there's a variety of reasons for this to hold true, those things don't necessarily have a major impact. I mean, the expense, this is a huge expense for your cat, but it's not easy at this point to say, well, if you're on the high end of that or the low end, where does that mean you turn out at the end? Uh, our years of doing this would suggest it's way too soon to know that answer. So don't fret one way or the other wherever you fall there. It's just an observation of how much your calf weighed coming into the yard and what you could have received potentially if you sold that calf instead of putting it on feed. So one of the things we want to think about at this particular point, because you all, in this case, are cattle feeders. But for most folks, they're going to have sold these calves to somebody else who's going to be the cattle feeder. And maybe at your family's place, that's the more frequent way that you do it. Maybe you, you sell them in large groups, or maybe you take your calves to a sale barn in smaller groups, whichever the case. And so some things to think about what a buyer of potential feedlot cattle is going to be looking for. And again, we're going to give a, a kind of a big overview but we're going to have a speaker a couple months down the road who's going to be going through some of this stuff pretty thorough. Um, but just a quick overview. First and foremost, they're going to look for health. One of the things we talked about, if you recall, when we discussed picking up your cattle, there was even a statement in there that said, hey, if there was an animal that didn't look terribly healthy, we reserve the right to not bring it down to Columbia, Missouri, because health is a huge concern in the feedlot sector. Uh, not only because clearly, obviously we want healthy animals to, to be, uh, to have good animal husbandry and to take good care of your animals. Clearly that's the most important piece, but keeping getting a sick animal healthy can be remarkably expensive. And I'm guessing along the way as this project unfolds, 
one of us will have a calf or two that gets sick. That's the nature of the way this probably works. And we'll get to look at some of those numbers and see what those costs can do. Um, they, can, they can bite us just a little bit. So there are things we can do to aid in health. That doesn't mean we can prevent it. Sometimes we can do all the things right and it can still turn out poorly for us and a calf can get sick. Just in the same way that uh, maybe you're an athlete and you try to eat right and try to stay healthy and try to avoid uh, getting too nasty outside in some miserable weather and all those things, but still sometimes you're gonna get sick. And so some things we can do, make sure these calves are vaccinated effectively. That's usually a multi-round series of these BRD type uh, drugs that we talked about earlier. The data is very clear that animals that have been uh, effectively vaccinated are much more successful at staying healthy in the feed yard. In fact, um, it's very clear the level of mortality and morbidity or sickness that comes with animals that, that don't receive a double round of vaccination. Also, another issue that's hugely important is, are your calves kept on the farm a little while or on the ranch, taught to eat from a bunk, prepared for what comes next. And we typically call that a conditioning period. Are they, do they have a post weaning, meaning after they're weaned off their mom, do they have a post weaning conditioning period where they learn to kind of fend for themselves and eat from a bunk and drink out of a water and all those things that maybe they have to learn for the first time in that kind of environment before you ever sell them, again, at the sale barn or on Superior or you send them straight to the feed yard. That, post weaning conditioning period, again, greatly reduce, reduces sickness and death loss. And then the last thing that feedlot buyers are oftentimes looking for is they would like to see a minimal level of commingling or mixing of groups of cattle that have never been around each other. Because just like I'm guessing many of you are going to school right now, and you know what's going on in the world as well as I do. And so there's reasons they're trying to ask different groups of kids to kind of keep their distance from other groups of kids, just because if we can help minimize the chance you can share things, that's a benefit. And you all are all vaccinated and you're all healthy. So in the same way we're trying to do, we're trying to practice social distancing with our uh, uh, feeder kids. And so feedlot buyers certainly appreciate that. They're gonna be looking for cattle that have genetic merit. They have uh, the genetics built in them to grow well. Because ultimately a feedlot's primary job is to function as a very fancy hotel for cattle. Their job is to help cattle grow, grow efficiently, and grow as cheaply as they can, but to grow. And so they're going to be looking for genetic merit for feedlot gain. You and I would typically see that genetic merit in the form of Weaning weight EPDs, yearling weight EPDs, uh, post weaning gain EPDs, average daily gain EPDs in certain cases. Those sort of tools give us a great sense of how do these cattle grow. Now, sometimes a feedlot buyer may or may not specifically look for EPDs. Sometimes they're looking for visual clues. Do they think these cattle, um, do they visibly look like the kind of cattle that have some growth room? And at the same time, are these cattle? Um, a little bit thin in terms of their condition. They don't want cattle that are too heavy conditioned or too fat because that tends to mean those cattle won't gain quite as well. They're not going to take off in the feed yard quite as well as those cattle that are a little bit thinner. So, and then another times they'll, they will look for genetic merit in the fashion that they've bought cattle from this person for a lot of years and those cattle always gain well. And so they're going to buy those cattle on reputation more to, to more so than knowledge of the genetics, but the reputation kind of speaks to some of the genetics. Clearly, everybody's interested in carcass value. That's very important. That's where the big paycheck comes. And so we need to, to have genetics and management approaches that can help us maximize carcass value. And for these feedlot buyers, again, carcass value really frankly breaks down to about three things. Um, that is the amount of pounds you're going to sell, a concept called yield grade that we'll talk about another day, and a concept called quality grade. And quality grade is essentially eating experience. And you and I talk about that a lot in the sense of marbling. And actually, marbling and quality grade greatly outweigh the economic importance in the business right now over yield grade. 
And so growth and marbling EPDs are the two heavy drivers of carcass value. And so they're going to be seeking cattle that can do that. And as a result, um, those of us who are trying to provide those cattle need to, to be aware of that. Now, one thing for us to also remember, feedlot buyers are looking to be able to make money. And so on occasion, and we're going to all be guilty of this, myself included, we'll make just phenomenal cattle. These are hot shot cattle. They are out of the right bulls, out of the best cows. We've got them healthy. They are slick. They are looking great. And we'll take them to the sale and they'll probably bring a nice dollar figure, might even top the sale. But you might on occasion be surprised that one particular buyer that you thought would be all over those cattle, he might not even bid on those cattle. And it might come as a shock. Well, remember, each of these feedlots are, are good at different things. Some of them have different skills than others. And sometimes for some folks, they might look at those cattle that you brought in and they may say, I may love to have them, but I can't pay that amount for them now and be able to turn a profit in the end. So even those cattle are great and I would love to have them, they're just too expensive for me to be able to be able to, to make a profit on down the road. So price point is clearly going to be something that's very important. They want roads that are uniform and consistent. So that means a variety of things. That means if, if they can have their druthers, if you look on big sales, if you watch make some of the major sale facilities around your part of the world, some of the online auctions, you'll see the pins that bring the highest figures are single sex pins, typically steers because they gain a bit more efficiently than heifers do. But heifers will sell pretty good if they're in a heifer group because it's much easier for that feed yard to manage steers like steers and heifers like heifers. Mixed pins typically either give them problems from a management standpoint or more likely they're gonna sort your cattle into different groups if they can unless uh, somebody retains ownership and says, I got to have them all together. They're going to try to put those heifers with other heifers and those steers with other steers. So they want cattle that are consistent in terms of their gender. They want cattle that are fairly consistent in terms of their weight range. If they buy calves from you at a sale that range three and 400 pounds, you can, you can be certain they're going to take those calves back to their own feed yard and they're going to sort them and commingle them with other calves so they can get groups of calves that are in much tighter weight ranges because what they want is a pin of steers or a pin of heifers that's on a similar feeding schedule and timeline so that they can get them into that feed yard pen have them in that feed yard pen for some many number of months and that most of those cattle will go out of that same pen over the course of a very limited number of weeks what they don't want is to put all these cattle in a big pen and then there are 15, 20, 30 head that straggle on for weeks and weeks and weeks after everything else is done. and just can't tolerate that. There's too much loss involved with that. So, and there's other similarities. They could be hide color, um, they could be confirmation, they could be fat cover. And then the other thing that aids in uniform inconsistency is load lots. And that goes into a little bit what I was talking about in terms of your semi loads. We want to be able to ship our fat cattle, our finished cattle, in a full load. They'd like to be able to buy cattle in full loads. It maximizes their freight dollar. So you have to understand if Chip takes a few calves to town, and if I take um, 10 head of steers to town, and Jackie takes 15, and Bailey takes 100, well, Bailey's almost certainly going to get paid more than Jackie or Chip because she has large groups of calves that they can eat the shipping on pretty easily. My calves and Jackie's calves are going to have to be commingled with somebody else. Uh, otherwise, they got to pay less to offset the shipping costs, things of that nature. So large groups that are uniform are going to speak to a buyer. And then the last thing we'll talk about here from what are, what's a feedlot buyer looking for. There's also some of these things that when they go to send these cattle to the packing plant, there are things that potentially give them a little leg up, a little bump here and there. Sometimes there are carcass premiums, um, you know, quality grades premiums that are uh, driven by certain certified programs that uh, you know, speak to hide color or different breed makeups, 
Sometimes there are premiums for cattle that are natural, meaning they don't have any hormones or things of that nature. Um, again, not taking in horns, potentially having the ability to have traceable cattle. All these things and many, many more can help them add to their return on investment, and they're more likely to pay up to you on the front side if you're selling these cattle to them. So we're going to we're going to spend the rest of our time this evening quickly going through a tool that we call the IGS feeder profit calculator. This tool is designed very specifically to do exactly what we just talked about: to help you as a feeder calf seller, at least in this example, even though you're not selling this particular set of calves. Um, and a potential buyer to use a tool where you can get to a cat's value. And just real quickly, I don't want to go through all this too long, but some of you might say IGS, I don't even know what that means. IGS is a group of a bunch of breed associations, along with a, a, a genomics firm and some other interested folks who work together in, in, in unison and do a lot of data together. And together, there's about there's records on about 20 million head of cattle in this database, so we can get really, really smart on how we use data to make EPDs and genetic predictions. And so you can think of it as essentially the genetics arm of the American Cemental Association. That suffices for now. Again, you all know, you come from an era, I'm an old guy, um, but you all come from an era where you use lots of data to make decisions. It might be something that, um, how many folks, I don't even know, I'm, I'm about to show my silliness. I don't know, is it like a post or, Die, whatever you put something on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something like that, you're going to say you, you see data. Did people acknowledge that they like that? That's data. We'd like to use more useful, more important, more serious data, but that's data as well. And so we take billions of points of data to try to help you and, and, and folks who are selling cattle to make serious decisions. And so I want to show you one quick thing. Using that kind of a serious approach to data, I want to go through this graph because I think it's really important for you all as young cattle breeders, you all are going to be the folks who are making decisions on your farm and ranch in the not real distant future. Long after folks like me are done and gone, you're going to be making these decisions. And I want to show you what this sort of measured, responsible approach to data usage has done. So I'm guessing, well, I know with confidence that none of you who are SPC participants were even born when this chart started. But if you go back to 1997 and just go from there, in the last few years on this chart, I just haven't updated it mostly because I'm lazy, but again, the, the trends stay more or less the same. And what you see, these are trends just for Simmental. And what you'll find is there's essentially no breed association that's been able to amass this sort of trend line, but others are getting pretty close because they're working hard. And what do you see? We decided a long time ago in 1997, that we, and actually before that, that we better get serious about things that make you and your parents money. And so let's look at this real quick, because I want you to see that you can do these things if you devote to them. You have to measure, you have to track, and it takes a while. But if you're diligent, look, if you don't know this back in the mid 90s, Back in the late 80s and early 90s, people would have thought of birth rates on Simmental cattle of being insane. Now you don't even hear that anymore. Why? Because you look at that top red dotted line, that's calving ease. Calving ease is growing through the roof, meaning they come easier. And that's predominantly because birth weight, the solid red line that goes down, is whipped through the floor, meaning as they're smaller, they come easier. But at the same time, you might say, okay, fine, you're just making small cattle. But look really closely at the purple and the green line. Those are the growth traits of weaning and yearling weight. And see how those two trend right together and are still continuing to rise, even as birth weights are going down? That's biologically very hard to do. When you sit in biology class, birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight are all growth traits. And to make those go in different directions is remarkably difficult. And it's impressive what your folks and grandparents and others have done to pull that off. And at the same time, you can see the yellow line of marbling. Clearly, everybody talks about that. That's one of the biggest things that we talk about in the business. And the last thing I want to point out is, is the line that you may not be as familiar with this terminology. And that's the gray line that says it's called stability. And you can see that gray line has shot up and stayed at a very high level. And what does that mean? 
That means a cow lasts a long time. She stays around or stayability. This is the kind of stuff that you can accomplish with a good data approach, much like that we use through IGS. So I won't go any farther than that. But when this shows up on the website later, I encourage you to look at that trend graph and talk to your folks about it. Um, maybe talk to your ag advisor or 4 H beef leader. I think it's something that you can have some good conversations about. Real quick to the profit calculator so I can get this done. This tool is one that you better pay close attention because you've got to use it soon. I'm not going to go through all of these small pieces i'd encourage you to maybe take a few minutes to look at those when this shows up but to keep us on time what we're going to use is known genetics in particular the sires you're using plus known management specifically those two things we talked about earlier your vaccination history and that post weaning period and you're going to do this this week so pay close attention what we do is we get a management value, how your animals differ in terms of management value compared to what we deem the average cat, and how your animals differ from genetic evaluation of what we deem the average cat. In this case, it's the average Angus genetic profile. And so what we do is we add those two things together to the final bottom piece, which is gonna be the most important, called the total relative value. And what that is, is for those of you, maybe parents in the background or some of the older folks, what essentially we're doing is we're running a break-even calculator, a break-even calculation on your calf under your genetic decisions and your management and comparing them to the average Angus genetic profile with a calf that's 60% weaned and 60% vaccinated. How do you do this? This is how you do this. You may, you could write this down, but you can easily go see this later. You're going to go to a website called International Genetic Solutions. And when you get to that page, Right here towards the top, there's going to be a link that says FPC. You can also click to it right over here, where it has the big logo with the cap head. That's also the logo for the FPC. And Chip, oh. they'll be yep. getting the direct link too in their email. Uh, oh, she's making it nice. Thank you, Bailey, for letting them, me know that. And so if you didn't have that, then you'd have to go through this process. You'd go to another page where it says you're the producer. You click on that, and then that would put you to the input sheet right here. But it sounds like Bailey's being nice, and so she's saving you doing those couple extra steps. But you're going to go to that calculator input form, and you're going to put in the information that actually Bailey handles the day-to-day -day of the IGS feeder profit calculator, and she's going to see your information. She's going to be the one that interacts with you on this. And you're going to put your name, your contact info, in this case, your number of head. For some of you, that's one cat. For some of you, it might be two. For some of you, it might be three or four. Clearly, they're all steers. You know the color and the horn status of your calf. You're going to tell me when they were born, or Bailey, rather, when they were weaned, when they were delivered. You can call that that uh, 1118, if you like. Um, and you have your weight because it's going to show up and I'm going to show you where to find that in just a minute. And you can put in the vaccinations um, that, that we gave. Again, you can give any vaccinations you gave on farm. You can give the vaccinations and the implants and the dewormings that we put in this PowerPoint. And you can look at this again and put those in. But then you're going to have to give the registration information or the sire information that you have and a little bit about the calendar. I'm going to let Bailey walk you through some of that. She'll probably have to help a few of you, but that's okay. Um, and I'll, I'll let her fill in any gaps. But the long and the short of it is, she's gonna send you back a certificate that looks something like this. And this number right here, it's 858 for this example. This is a large group of cats, um, larger than what you're gonna have. It's 72 head of 670 weight black calves. And what this says in this set of calves, that the person selling those has built in an additional $8.58 a hundred over the quote unquote average cap in the business. So the seller comes armed with facts to a sale barn, to a superior sale, to a direct sale off the farm. And the buyer then sees that, okay, so you say you've built an $8.58 and this third party, IGS, agrees you've built an $8.58. Now, we should note it's not likely the buyer is going to pay $8.58 because that would mean they're just breaking even again. They'd like to make money. But they might split the difference with you and go, hey, we might go three or $4 higher. So that means the producer wins a little, they win a little. The feeder profit calculator this year alone, Bailey had to correct me, but I think the last time I saw, well, we ran maybe 17,000 calves through the profit calculator in 2020, something of that nature. 
I'm yep. I'm that, that sounds good to me. I, it's been a couple of days since I've looked at that spreadsheet. Okay. Uh, and so just a quick example, I'm going to, this shows how different cow types, and you'll see uh, when Bailey will play with this, but different cow types have different value. And so here's a situation where you have the same sort of sires, and if you put them on some Herford Red Angus females, they're going to have, a, their calves are going to have a different terminal value than if you get all the way down here to where you have an Angus Gelby cow. There's just different terminal value built into those breeds. I'm going to give you one fairly thorough example, and we're going to start to wrap this thing up. I just picked a bull who's about the heaviest used bull in the Simmental business in the last number of years, a bull called Cowboy Cut. Um, been very successful, but that's the reason we're using him is just because he's a heavily used sire. And so this is that bull. If you want to go look him up, go, go do so. I encourage you to do it. Um, but we're going to show that we all have to work together. So let's say what we have here, this is a picture of the software that Bailey uses. You won't see it, but Bailey uses this. And on the screen, there are three gray boxes in the middle. And what these are, are the names and the reg numbers for three sons of Cowboy Cut. These are three direct sons of his, three direct bulls. And we're going to say, hypothetically, you went and bought these bulls at a sale. And you were making calves out of them. Well, these are good bulls with good genetics coming out of a good sire. But we got to do the full package. I can't just go buy bulls. And in this case, I'm putting them on a cow herd. You can see in this box, it says 100% Angus cows right down here. So I'm going to put some cowboy cut bulls on top of some Angus cows. Nice name. But up here at the top, it tells me a few other things. These are steers. Average weight of my group, 600 pounds. But there's a couple things to note here. In there, it shows that there's a box that, that you would click if these calves have had that post-weaning preconditioning period that we talked about, and if they've been doubly vaccinated for BRD. Neither one of those boxes are clicked. So what that means is I bought the good genetics, bred them to good cows, but I didn't vaccinate them. I didn't do the management job. So even though I've got good genetics, I've built in a negative return for the buyer. Because why? Because the likelihood is some calves are going to get sick, maybe even some calves are going to die. And so even though I've got good genetics, management didn't come to the table to help. Now, here's the same bulls, same cows, same weight sears, but this time I still didn't keep them in a post weaning period, but I did vaccinate them twice. You can see if you look in that little box, and it might be hard to see on your screen, but there's a little check box where it said, did you vaccinate for against BRD? And that means are they doubly vaccinated? In this case, yes, they are. And so I immediately moved that negative number to a positive nearly $3 a hundred weight. Meaning now is $3 enough to get the buyer to do much? Maybe a little bit. That'll get their attention if you have serious metrics that show that I can add that kind of value. But what if I go the full package? And in this case, all of you will have because your calves have received all the things it takes to get both of these boxes checked up here um, at this point in time. And so what you'll see is got the same bulls, same cows. Now they've both been weaned for more than 30 days. They've been vaccinated. Um, now these calves are in a position to fully express themselves in a feed yard. These are the kind of calves that can command a premium, essentially $10 a hundred weight. You might be able to garner an extra $5 a hundred weight, $5 on a six weight calf, that's five times six. So that's an extra $30 for each calf that I would have on that load. And remember, um, you know, a lot of these folks are selling large loads. That can add up really quick for taking those couple extra steps. So your assignment is this. And I'm going to let Bailey explain this to you. Okay, so you all will be getting this shortly in an email. So this webinar is over with, it'll be sent out. Um, but you'll see both of these files. And the important one, obviously, is on the left. It explains the assignment. You have two options this month. And they're both similar. And like we talked about earlier, you all have to run your calves through the FPC. And I would recommend doing that in the next couple of days because there's a lot of you and it'll take a couple of days to get those pumped out and turned around. So you don't want to be pushing that very long. But you have two assignment options. And the first is going to be 
you are going to put yourselves in the shoes of a cattle buyer and you're going to be listing five things that you think you would want to look for. And so obviously Chip talked about a handful of those and you can use some of those things. I would encourage you to also think about some things that might be a little bit more individual to you, might be more unique to your situation or the part of the country you're in. And I am happy for you all to be as creative and as interesting as you want, but you better back up whatever you bring. Um, so I want you to take those few things that you point out and make a list for me. And you're just going to expand on those a little bit and how those items you think play into the calves and how important they are. And then compare your own calves to your own criteria. Your second option then is you're going to pretend that the calves that you submit for the FPC, so your SPC calves, are your herd. So obviously that's not how that's going to work in real life. They're all steers, but we're just going to pretend for today. And you're going to do a little bit of research on your own time and find two bulls that you think might complement your herd, might make them better in whatever areas you want to make better. Um, obviously, we're going to focus on the terminal side a little bit more with this, but Again, I'm open to some interpretation as long as you can back it up. So you're going to send those sires that you select to me over at SBC at SendGene.com like we've been communicating through since up to now. And then I will run you some FPC certificates on those as well and send those to you. And then your job will be to do a write-up on if those were what you expected, which bull you'd ultimately choose between those with the information provided and then with that, you'll see the rubric also that's up, and this goes for both of these assignments, but obviously different assignments. So there's a few things with that content and application criteria that's going to vary between the two, but you can then read through that and see what I'm expecting, what I'll be looking for in those, and a couple of things I do want to point out. Um, with There are different age groups. If you are unaware of those, we can go over those real quick. There's different age groups for the actual contest based on ASA and AJSA regulation. Hold on just one second. Let me pull that up for sure so I don't tell you all the wrong dates or the wrong ages. I apologize. So those are going to be the juniors. If you are between eight and 13 years old, intermediates between 14 and 17, and seniors between 18 and 21, and you'll see on the rubric that intermediates and seniors, you're pretty well just lumped together. So just make sure that you are paying attention to that because there's a little bit of differences between those age categories and make sure you're meeting your elite requirement and you're submitting it on time because those are important. And make sure you include one extra source if you're a junior and two extra sources if you're an intermediate or a senior. And make sure you list those on your assignment for me. Anything else, Chip? That sounds pretty good to me. Um, and again, just to clarify, as Bailey was saying, juniors will be compared to juniors, intermediates to intermediates, and so on and so forth. And so uh, we think that's quite important, but you'll be receiving this, this, the specifics so you can study those. And, and again, just like Bailey said, we want you to have some ownership over this. So enjoy making it your own. Um, just meet some of those expectations uh, that, that she has for the various age groups. And remember, uh, there is recognition for this category uh, at the end of this event. And more importantly, it is mandatory. So make sure that you get this done. Real quick, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna recognize for next month's webinar that will be, you might make a note on that fancy phone that you have. So it reminds you that on January 5th, which is the first Tuesday of January and well after the holidays. So hopefully we're all starting to get back into a routine. We'll be when we have our next webinar. Again, Dr. Jackie Atkins is gonna be giving us a rundown on genomics and genetics in general. And so we appreciate that. And then 
we appreciate Dr. Atkins being willing to do that for that for us. And so if you have any questions, we're happy to take them, or if anybody, any staff has a question. While we are doing that, um, I, I do want to do one quick thing, and that is I want to show you, if you haven't seen it, something on the junior website. So if you have not visited Junior Simmental in some number of days, I want you to remember. So if you go to juniorsimmental.org, you can go to the SPC program. You scroll down, same place you register for this webinar, and you click on CAF data. As I get information from the feed yard, you'll have the latest information in there as soon as it's available. And so if you look today, and Bailey, can you confirm, do they know their SVC tag numbers at present? Yes, those were all sent out today, and they should have all of their tags as well as a link to the SVC site as well. So if they get confused on where to go, they can find that pretty quick. Okay, so to note, we don't list the names on these calves, okay? So essentially nobody knows whose calf is who unless you happen to own. If you own calf 67, you know that's your calf, but nobody else knows that's your calf. And so that gives us an opportunity to go through this data because as we start to build a fair amount of data, and just as we come back in the next month's webinar, there's going to be a lot more data filled in. And as we start talking about some of that, we want everybody to feel comfortable evaluating that data and making it about animal 66 or 67, not about some person. So we keep the names off of this sheet. Nobody will know who those calves belong to. But you can see as of today, uh, Bailey sent those to you in your email. And so you can go here and you can see the weight of your calf as of 1118. You can see what the valuation of that cap was, and all that stuff is in there for you at present. And not that you probably care what the EID number is, um, it doesn't affect your life one little bit, but we did go ahead and put it in there so you would know in case you walk by and you look in pin 10 and you're confident that, oh, 982000, blah, 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 that's, that's mine. So if you want to do that, I just read. Your tag 62 would be easier for me, but you do whatever you wish. Um, so with that, if we do have any questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, we'll cut you free. I'm seeing no questions on my side. Anybody else see any or receive any? I will take that as a no. Ladies so, and gentlemen, go ahead, go ahead. Just one thing I didn't know, do you want to touch on just reminding them that billing will be coming out later this month and a bit yeah, about what we expect with that? Oh, yeah, thank you. So, so billing will come out typically a number of days after the month turns over. Thank you for the reminder. Um, and so in the next number of days, to give you a sense of the process, in the next number of days, What's happening is at the feed yard, they have to compile all your grow safe data. So it's not quite as simple as just um, a traditional feed yard where, okay, it's the end of the month, the, the scale says you have this much feed going in the bunk, bill on. Well, Mr. Leitman's going to spend a fair amount of time going through the grow safe data to make sure everything mashes up, make sure everything's good, getting all that stuff in there. That takes a few extra days. So I would suspicion that I will get that information from Mr. Leiteman early next week. And then we'll have to then correspond that over and put it into bill format. We don't get it that way from them. And so it's gonna be a number of days. We'll know this month, um, this is the first time they've used the new version of the GrowSafe system for this sort of project. And so we'll see how many days it takes. We should know after this first round um, how that's gonna happen. Once those go out, we'll make sure you know. We'll give you kind of a timeline to get your bills paid. You'll usually get a couple weeks uh, in there to get that done. But right now, I would suspicion you will probably see your bills somewhere around 12, 15. Those will be the bills for November all the way up to 12, 30. Is that sufficient or did I miss anything, Bailey? I think that's all that I had. Probably okay. 
you'll be seeing that for the next webinar. Okay, thank you for the reminder. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's eight o'clock. That's an hour. We try to keep these things to that. So I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, reach out to, to Ms. Abel through the SPC email or to myself. And until then, on behalf of the entire American Simmons Hall Association, we wish you and your families a, a very blessed and Merry Christmas. If you need anything from us, reach out. Until then, enjoy the holidays, and we will talk to you in four or five weeks. Thank you all, and have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.